In 1917, during the final stages of World War I at Caporetto and Cambrai, Germany unleashed a new form of weapon in an effort to break the consistent stalemate of trench warfare. This new German weapon caught the enemy completely off guard. But unlike the British and French, who were also developing their new weapons, such as the tank, Germany's new weapon was nothing to do with technology, or equipment. Theirs was more a new form of warfare, and one which was to become, in later years, a tried and well-tested practice. Germany's new weapon was the use of stormtroopers. Stormtroopers, or shock troops, were elite soldiers, specially trained for infiltration tactics. They sought out weak spots in opposing defenses and then literally stormed that position using the maximum amount of force. By causing utmost confusion in the enemy rear, the stormtroopers were highly successful. Within months of becoming chancellor in January 1933, Hitler had transformed a democratic Germany into a dictatorship, imposed through terror disguised by skillful propaganda. By 1939, some six years later, Hitler had completely changed the face of the modern Germany. The country was now organized under the Nazi regime, which maintained power and a hold over the people through the SS and the Gestapo. 
National Socialism had spread its tentacles through every aspect of German life, from education and the arts to labor and religion, and ordinary Germans lived and worked under its shadow. thousand men, six warships above 10,000 tons, and no submarines or military aircraft. Hitler, however, on his rise to power, swept aside any notion that he would follow such restrictions. He was determined to break the shackles of Versailles and rearm Germany. By 1934, he had given orders that his armed forces should be strong enough to defend Germany within five years and capable of offensive action within eight years. By 1939, Hitler's military machine was gathering strength or were rolling off the production lines. His navy had a fleet of battleships, heavy cruisers and destroyers, along with 57 U-boats. The Wehrmacht had a strength of 86 infantry divisions, six tank divisions, and eight motorized divisions. The mere presence of Hitler's armed forces was grossly and successfully magnified by his propaganda machine. This served to deter all opposition by much stronger nations. As his armies marched into the Tsar, the Rhineland, Austria, the Sudetenland, and finally the whole of Czechoslovakia. Initially, the only body of rearmament and the subsequent military triumphs were enough of a bribe to ensure the continued support of the generals. The Wehrmacht now possessed within its ranks a new breed of soldier. Men who had been indoctrinated into the Nazi ideals and beliefs since childhood. This new German soldier was tough, resilient, well-trained, and above all, dedicated. His uniform would be much the same as his counterparts within the Wehrmacht, but this is where the similarity would end. This new soldier would form the backbone of some of the hardest and toughest units within Hitler's army. He would be fearless in battle with little regard for his own personal safety. Unlike World War I, when there were designated stormtrooper units, the World War II stormtroopers would come from within the divisions of the Waffen-SS, the commandos, grenadiers, infantry and parachute regiments. In September 1939, Hitler's troops invaded Poland. Many had foreseen the coming conflict, but when it came, few could have predicted the astonishing success of the Wehrmacht. The attack on Poland saw Germany unleash an entirely new kind of warfare. Striking with unprecedented speed and precision, Hitler's armies launched the world's first blitzkrieg or lightning war. Providing the spearhead of the swift and powerful invasion force were six panzer divisions. With the formation of these independent panzer divisions, Germany had developed the tank into a decisive weapon, deviating from the World War I concept that the tank was merely an escorting weapon for the infantry. Backing up the tanks and mobile forces on the ground and pounding the airfields and centers of communication of the air were the awesome dive bombers of the Luftwaffe. There was also a third element, along with the tanks and dive bombers, involved in the Blitzkrieg operations, stormtroopers.
These troops were used alongside the Panther divisions. They identified weak spots in the enemy defenses and also isolating through the enemy's rear echelons. With the enemy then pinned down and unable to respond or make meaningful counter moves, the Panzer divisions were free to advance over hitherto impossible distances and move forward towards objectives in days rather than the months of previous campaigns. The basis of German philosophy at the beginning of the war and through to 1942 remained that of blitzkrieg tactics. Throughout the invasion of Poland, it was repeated both on the grand and small scale. This was particularly noticeable with the use of stormtroopers and their emphasis on aggression and speed. Like all successful concepts, that of Blitzkrieg was simplicity itself, although it is still often misunderstood, even today. The idea was to mass sufficient force against one sector of the enemy line in order to achieve superiority. Once the stormtroopers had broken a hole in the defenses, the panzer divisions and the infantry would keep moving as rapidly as possible to keep the enemy off balance. Secondary and diversionary attacks, either side of the breakthrough point, prevented the enemy from transferring reinforcements. It was this idea of continuous movement, with an almost total disregard for flanks, which made the Blitzkrieg concept work so well at the outset of the war. Despite having an overall superiority in terms of manpower, guns and tanks, the Poles were unable to respond quickly enough to check the German tidal wave of men and machines. Awesome flamethrowers were one of the most feared weapons used by the stormtroopers. Employed in close up fighting, this brutal weapon was extremely effective. The mere threat of their presence often proved sufficient to force the defenders of a strong point to surrender. The short range of this weapon made the flamethrower crew's approach to the target very dangerous as they would be the most vulnerable to attack from snipers. Concealed enemy marksmen would often aim for the flamethrower crews first. Therefore, the units storming a position would ruthlessly concentrate on flushing out all enemy snipers before the main units arrived. It took just over three weeks for the Germans to devour Poland. And on the 27th of September, 
wreathed in flames, the capital city of Warsaw capitulated. By the beginning of April 1940, Hitler's forces were advancing on Western Europe. Once again, the tactical employment of stormtroopers was used at the front line of the Blitzkrieg invasion force, clearing the path for the Panzer divisions racing behind them. Stormtroopers, although often motorized to keep pace with the fast-moving armored divisions, seldom fought from their vehicles. The practice was to move up into an advantageous position, dismount, then attack on foot. The first of the Low Countries to fall to the stormtroopers was Luxembourg. On the 10th of May, Germany invaded Belgium and Holland simultaneously. Standing in their way near the frontier with Belgium was the fortified Albert Canal, vital to Belgium's eastern defenses, with its supposedly impregnable fortresses. In a joint effort using airborne troops and stormtroopers, the forts were simultaneously attacked, including this one at Eben Amiel with the machine gunners and mortar crews laying down as high a concentration of firepower as possible, the rest of the unit dashed towards their objective. Crossing the canal using small inflatable rafts, with air cover provided by the dive bombers of the Luftwaffe, this was a classical operation using the stormtroopers and one for which their method of warfare was best suited. Taking a strongly defended position, using the maximum amount of aggression and speed. You can see here clearly how one intrepid stormtrooper uses a telescopic rod to throw a grenade into the small opening of the concrete bunker with devastating results. Within a few hours, those defending the fort have little alternative other than to surrender their position. The German whirlwind continued west through Belgium towards France. There were many rivers to be crossed, which served as natural defenses for Belgium. But these proved little obstacles for the stormtroopers. One by one, the motorized craft would ferry the troops across. The assaults on the rivers were planned and executed by using shock troops or stormtroopers. They attacked key points away from the main bridges, which were their main objectives. The bridges themselves could then be attacked from the rear, creating maximum confusion with the greatest possible effect. In reality, these rivers, such as the Meuse, were crossed with relative ease. Von Blumentritt, the operations officer of the advancing Army Group A, later wrote, 
According to plan, the stormtroopers were to attack the Meurs and force a passage for the subsequent crossing of the Armoured Corps. Previous to the assault, the whole of the artillery would have to be in position en masse and take steps to ensure a plentiful supply of ammunition. However, the defences were lighter than expected. Here and there, a few French machine guns were firing from small, ludicrous concrete emplacements on the west banks of the Meurs. That was all. We initially feared this as a French ruse, but the dreaded Meurs position was almost non-existent and only weakly defended. Then the panzer race across the river began. Within a few days, the Belgian towns were being overrun as the Germans swept on. Enemy counterattacks were being smashed in their path. It was very much the same story for the Army Group B, advancing rapidly through Holland. Resistance was light. Stormtroopers seldom wore the full battlefield kit worn by the rest of the infantry. Instead, they were lightly equipped for mobility and were able to go into action with the minimum amount of hindrance of carrying kit. Standard weaponry would also include a Car 98 carbine and also a submachine gun or hand pistol. When shock troops or stormtroopers had first been established in World War I, it was never intended for the units to become permanent features of the German order of battle. Instead, they were to be the role models for the rest of the army to emulate. Once this had been established, the stormtroop formations were to disappear. Consequently, the stormtroop battalions were never incorporated into the peacetime army structure. When Hitler had come to power, the name Stormtroopers had been hijacked by one of the paramilitary groups from the German Workers' Party, which called itself the Sturmabteilung. During World War II, although there was no official Stormtroop regiment or unit, there were small elite units within the Wehrmacht, which specialized in the same tactics used by the Stormtroopers of World War I. A great many of these came from the Waffen-SS, and it was during this campaign in 1940 that their title became official. For the final push into France, Hitler's armies had to clear the Ardennes forest. A mammoth invasion force of tanks and armored divisions, along with thousands of men, had been assembled. As this mighty army rumbled westward, stormtroopers once again would be at the spearhead of the attack.
They brought up light artillery and laid lines of communication. Paths were smashed through the forest to clear the way for the advancing tanks, heavy artillery and motorized divisions. Under heavy fire from the enemy, motorized units brought up small inflatable rafts and rubber boats to the front line. These would be used to cross the river and secure the bridgeheads. In typical Blitzkrieg style, waves of Stuka dive bombers of the Luftwaffe screamed overhead, bombarding the enemy positions. Heavy ground fire was concentrated on the Allied defenses and pillboxes, giving the maximum amount of cover for the stormtroops up ahead. The attack continued into the night. A never-ceasing hail of artillery shells, mortars and rockets rained on the enemy. By daybreak, the stormtroopers had moved up into a position to launch an assault across the river, taking the enemy completely by surprise. Shock troops held the bridgehead until the engineers brought up pontoons and laid down a series of bridges for the motorized divisions. Within a few hours, the German army was on the move yet again, leaving behind in its wake a scene of destruction. All along the natural river defenses, the scene was much the same. France was beginning to fall into German hands, and the Allies were being driven back towards the English Channel. The principal difference between the men who volunteered for the Waffen-SS and those who went into other branches of the armed forces lay in the oath they had to swear, affirming total loyalty to the person of Adolf Hitler rather than to the state. This was a key factor in understanding the psychology of a stormtrooper, and why they were such tough and fanatical fighters, earning themselves the description, soldiers of destruction.
the lightning war was gathering momentum as the Wehrmacht poured across the French countryside. Town after town fell under German occupation as they raced towards their objective. Confronted by the German onslaught, some of the French fought to the very last man. Others broke rank and ran. The German build-up went on remorselessly. Counter-attack after counter-attack had failed for the French and their allies. The German armor from both army groups A and B had cut a swathe westwards, some 80 kilometers broad. The French 9th Army, which was in its path, was disintegrated. In fact, the Blitzkrieg almost went too fast at this point of the war and had to slow up in order to allow the following infantry to catch up and avoid being cut off. By now, the British Expeditionary Force had been ordered to retreat and save as many men as possible rather than risk any more counterattacks. During this operation, there were many reports which came to light at the end of the war, detailing how some of the elite Waffen-SS units, which were being used as stormtroopers, clearly demonstrated their will to win at all costs, as well as their sheer bravado in battle. There were, however, those instances which indicated a far darker side of the character produced by SS psychology and training. On many occasions, small pockets of retreating enemy soldiers who, in the face of the aggressive stormtroopers, realized that further resistance was futile and surrendered. But unwilling to risk losing the momentum of the advance and spare men to guard prisoners of war, the SS lined them up and gunned them down. Three divisions of Waffen-SS served in the battle for France during 1940. These were the Liebstandarte Adolf Hitler, the SS Panzer Division Das Reich, and the SS Panzer Division Totenkopf. These three, along with the Army's crack Gross Deutschland Regiment, all used elite units within their force as stormtroopers during this part of the war. In the autumn of 1940, Hitler made one of his most costly mistakes of the war. He ordered two panzer divisions and ten infantry divisions to move eastwards. He intended to start a war on two fronts and attack Russia. Within a few months, his armies had passed through Romania, Hungary and Bulgaria. On April the 6th, 1941, Hitler attacked Yugoslavia. Hitler now had at his command in the east some 50 divisions, along with a strong contingency of air support from the Luftwaffe. Facing this onslaught, the Yugoslavians had 28 divisions, many of which were poorly equipped, and they had made little preparations for defense. Worse still, they had dispersed their forces along a 1,600-kilometer border, holding back little as central reserve. There was little the Yugoslavians could do. Ill-prepared for war and trying to hold such a wide front meant they were soon overwhelmed. At a cost of only 151 German soldiers killed and 392 wounded, the Germans had netted 254,000 prisoners of war. 
However, although the country was capitulating some 300,000 Yugoslav troops, many of them Serbs, managed to evade capture and escaped to the forests and mountains. They managed to maintain an increasingly effective anti-German resistance, which hampered any further German advance. With the Panzer divisions now being kept at bay, German units were sent into the mountains to try and force out the defenders. Specialist mountain units of Waffen-SS stormtroopers were used with great effect. Although the stormtroopers did manage to capture many of the resistance force, many more still evaded capture. These ferocious fighters were to hound the Germans in the Balkans for the remainder of the war. It took only 12 days to completely overrun Yugoslavia in what Hitler codenamed Operation Punishment. On April the 12th, Easter Sunday, the Germans had entered Belgrade, Yugoslavia's capital. Defiant Yugoslavs still hold up in this city, which had been bombed to ruins and rubble by the Luftwaffe, took two more days to flush out completely. Three days later, the remainder of the country capitulated. Greece, which had been attacked by Germany on the same day as Yugoslavia, the British had been forced to retreat. Convoys of British and Greek troops were making their way south to be evacuated by the Royal Navy and taken to the island of Crete. In their line of retreat was a single road and a rail bridge across the Corinth ship canal. And Germany had a plan. On April the 26th, German paratroopers, using typical storm tactics, launched an airborne assault on the bridge. The British had already laid explosives along the bridge, 
but the raid happened so quickly that they had been unable to detonate them. Within just a few hours, the garrison on the bridge, defended mainly by Australians, had been captured. The German army, including the crack SS Liebstandarte Adolf Hitler, had meanwhile been storming through Greece. 15,700 Greek troops had been killed, and a further 300,000 had been made prisoner. The British, Australians, and New Zealanders had suffered 12,000 casualties of whom a further 10,000 had been captured. The Germans, on the other hand, had suffered 1,684 killed, 3,752 wounded, and 548 missing. A small price to pay for their territorial gains. In June 1941, German forces began to cross into Finland from Norway. They had been passing troops through here to reinforce their garrisons in northern Norway. Now the Germans had persuaded the Finns, who had been keen to regain their territory lost in early 1940, to join them in attacking the Soviet Union. Stormtroopers were once again at the spearhead of the German advance. The German stormtroopers were soon across the river bug and stormed Soviet defenses south of the river. Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of Russia, had begun. Most of the bridges over the river were captured intact. Some were even unguarded. The German war machine, involving more than 100 divisions, drove relentlessly forwards. The Russian defenders were shocked and confused from the start. By the end of the second day, the Panzer divisions had advanced 80 kilometers, quickly brushing aside any Soviet opposition. Ahead of the main force, shock troops attacked fiercely defended villages. Further south, they were advancing towards Leningrad. By mid-July, they had passed through the so-called Stalin Line. 
The Stalin line was a defensive belt built prior to 1939 to protect Western Russia. Stormtroops were also used to destroy enemy tanks, blocking the paths of the advancing German army. On the 27th of September, something did manage to slow up the German advance. The autumn rain started. This meant that Hitler's original plan to capture Moscow before the autumn had failed. The Germans were ill-prepared for the harshness of the Russian weather, and progress was slow. Motorized divisions often had to resort to becoming foot soldiers. But the inclement weather did not hamper the operations of the elite Waffen-SS troops. Although motorized infantry, they were used to fighting a war on foot. Stormtroopers from Liebstandarter Adolf Hitler, Totenkopf Das Reich, and the Panzer Grenadiers, which later became part of the Waffen-SS, all fought in the early Russian campaign. They set up advanced communication posts and attacked small targets. They were also used to destroy enemy positions such as bridges and railway lines, which could be used by the Russians to bring in reinforcements. The growing threat of German occupation inspired a number of Russians to join the partisans. They soon began to make attacks on the German lines of communication, which forced them to deploy an increasing number of troops to the rear areas. The partisans were no match for the often ruthless Panzer Grenadiers, who were deployed to hunt them down. Any that were captured were shot on sight, and those who helped in their escape or evasion were dealt with in the same manner. Complete villages suspected of aiding the partisans were often burned to the ground by the stormtrooper flamethrower units. Wherever they fought, whether on the eastern or western fronts, stormtroopers wreaked havoc and left a mass of destruction in their wake. The combination of the swift-moving panzer formations, accompanied by the panzer grenadier and SS stormtrooper units, proved to be so successful that within a few months, Germany ruled most of Europe, and a year later, she also controlled huge areas of Russia. The Allied nations, having neglected their armed forces, using outmoded tactics and being ill-prepared for such an onslaught, could not halt the concentrations of German armor and infantry. Though it was actually the British who coined the phrase Blitzkrieg or Lightning War, the successful operations of the panzers and the stormtroopers working hand in hand did seem to be pulling off lightning strokes on many occasions. Fast movement and the use of the aggressive stormtroopers to lead the attacks and consolidate any gains made the panzer divisions the most effective military formations in the world. Throughout the war, Germany used her stormtroopers to suit the changing conditions. They fought with skill, courage, and determination. During the campaign in Italy, stormtroopers using Krupp half-track vehicles thundered through town after town. 
By this stage of the war, many of the airborne divisions were now being used as stormtroopers within the infantry in support of the Panzers. During the counterattacks in Russia, despite the freezing harsh conditions, stormtroopers often defeated far superior forces. Throughout the changing conditions of the war, the esprit de corps of many of the stormtrooper units remained high in spite of reverses in the field of battle. But as more and more inexperienced replacement troops entered frontline units, combat effectiveness often suffered. However, even new troops could put up a strong resistance, especially when they are fighting for their fatherland. And as the Allies moved further towards German lines, Germany's troops fought an even more determined war as they retreated. Towards the last year of the war, most of the SS units had been forced into a defensive role, but they could still deal heavy blows against enemy forces. Ironically, the German troops, including those that served as stormtroopers, were defeated by the same tactics and similar formations that Germany had introduced early in the war. The tactical use of stormtroopers had been developed by Germany in World War I. Although there was no actual stormtrooper division, as there had been earlier in the century, their methods modified in World War II, accompanying the tanks into battle, resulted in overwhelming victories for the Germans. The Allied tactics used later in the war were remarkably similar to those which made the stormtroopers so successful. And these basic concepts still form the basis for tactics used by most armies today.